Okay, so welcome to Python. Um, in order to present a lot, a lot of information at the same time, I'm actually going to be using an online resource called, called Rosalind, um, which is named after Rosalind Franklin. Um, and it's um, a series of modules about bioinformatics, but also about algorithms and basic Python. Um, we're only going to be doing the basic Python part unless I feel like some of the other ones are relevant to the homework. Um, so we're gonna. So this thing that I wrote is actually you can all download it from the um, IBB 2014 site. Um, you can follow along. Um, it goes through a number of things that we're gonna do to kind of set you up for Rosalind, but also Python in general. Um, the thing about Rosalind is that it's actually a series of timed games. Sort of. I mean, it's it's more like you just have to submit a, a script and the answer um, to whatever problem that they they pop up. So time is of the essence. So we're gonna um, a lot of this is um, going towards streamlining your Python process. So before you get started, has everyone installed Python in some form or another? Okay. If you haven't, you should email me. My email's right there. Um, so go to a browser and type rosalind.info, that's the website. When you get there, it should ask you to please log in or create an account. Chances are you guys haven't heard of it, so you don't have an account, so just make one. And when you do have an account, please send your username to me using your NYUMC email. I just need to um, basically check if you've done the exercises. And by the way, I don't really care if you collaborate or something. Like it, it basically for me, I just see it as green instead of gray, like whatever the exercise is named. So if five of you got together and then one of you did each one, and then you all just submitted the same scripts, they, it actually randomly generates a new problem along the same lines every single time. So you can't actually just copy and paste someone's answers, but you can use someone else's scripts. Um, however, you would actually learn better if you wrote all the scripts yourself. I'm just saying that you can decide for yourself which one you want to do. Okay, does anyone still need some time to do what I just said? No, we're good? Okay. Um, the next thing I want you to do is go to your desktop and create a folder called Rosalind Pi as written on the document. And we're gonna save everything from class into this folder. And then the next, thing to you, the next thing you should do, if you know how to do it, um, is to configure your browser's download settings to download directly into that folder. Um, if you don't want to do that, if that's like going to bother you later on, you can also set it to just ask you where you want to put it, and then you can just always put it into that folder. I mean, it'll probably just remember it then after the first time. Um, most of the reason for this is that each Rosalind problem actually only gives you five minutes. Um, for the ones that we're going to be doing, they're actually simple enough that it, this doesn't matter as much, but um, still good to know. This finder? Oh, the black one, right, yeah. Okay, so um, the next thing I'm gonna do is introduce the concept of a terminal. So for those of you who have never done this before, um, you can actually operate your, like almost everyone can um, access their operating system through um, the command line using um, a program that's called terminal or command prompt, depending on which operating system. Um, the way that you do that here, it's actually already set up for me, but um, you can find it in Finder too, apparently, I think. Um, I think it's in utilities. Is it? Okay, thank you. It's under Applications, Utilities, Terminals, says someone who actually uses a Mac. 
So there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, it, it operates, um, well, the ones on Mac, anyway, operate um, using a, a language called Unix. Um, and it's, I guess I'm not going to teach you much about it, but you can do things like switch directories using the change directories command, which is just CD and then a space and then your path. So right now we're in the home folder. So um, I think, OK, wait, CD desktop. Um, I'm actually going to create a folder like okay so yeah so I don't know if you caught that but it actually just appeared right here because of what I just did um, and then I can change into that directory from my desktop um, another command not that it really matters um, you, you know you don't need to know this is actually ls if list what's in it. Because I have nothing in it, because I just created it, it shows nothing. Um, but what I'm going to be doing is downloading, OK, that. Hey, Amanda, can you help me use a Mac? <laughs> How do you put this in the Just put these three documents into my folder or something. Mm. Okay. These three documents, I'm sorry, I'm like just looking at this now. Yeah. Just open it, yeah. So you, when you. Okay. Oh, it's control? You said command. Um, either one works. Oh. I just save it, yeah. Okay, sweet. Okay, so what I just did was I pressed LS again, and now that all the files have been downloaded into it, it now lists them as, you know, all the files. So um, the first thing I'm going to, wait, okay, so I have the rest of this. Okay, so the first file that we're gonna look at is called first.py. It's gonna be your first Python file ever. So um, the first thing to know is that if you open it using a text editor, like any kind of text editor, it's actually just a couple lines which are actually right here. Um, so what this should teach you is that a Python file, like most, um, actually, a lot of programming files are just ordinary text files um, with an extension, appropriate extension, in this case, .py, and also um, a couple of things like, you know, the programming language itself, but um, in this case, a little thing on the top that tells the computer where to find Python on your computer, because it's installed somewhere in your file system. So um, it's not really important to know too much about what I actually wrote here, but um, the first line, import sys, imports a module called sys. Um, and then si if you do sys.argv, it's a, it's a method that creates a list. Or it's not, I guess it's not a method. It's, it's, a, it's something that retrieves um, the stuff that you write after you write a command on your um, terminal. That's a bit complicated. That's why I don't want you to think about it too much. Um, and it saves it as a variable, and a variable is, and we're going to go through this again, but a variable is just a name that stores a certain quantity of data, um, and then it's going to print it out again. So, so this is how you run a script. And then I'll just write blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So do you see how I wrote print your file name is, and then 
whatever I just wrote after Python um, and the script name. Um, so that's what it did. It retrieved that I wrote, um, you know, after I wrote after I wrote the script name first.py, I wrote blah blah blah, and then it retrieved that, and then it stored it into a variable, and then it printed it out again. So is anyone confused? Does anyone get it? I don't know. No, you won't. If you open up um, first.py, you will actually just see what I highlighted right here. Okay. Um, this is the script that will allow you to get that. So like if I wrote something else, like nothing. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that, that was the problem that I just struggled with, and um, apparently you can either control or command and then click it, and then that will ask you if you want to save the linked version as, and then if you do that, you can save it into you just save a them as text files, not as Python files? Right? You save them as text files with a .py extension. So you, instead of using .txt, you save it as .py. But actually, if you just save the file, it should already have all that put into it. Like I saved it as a Pi file when I made it. And then I we uploaded it onto the server. And then when you're downloading it, you should be downloading it as a dot pi file. Yes? Yes. Yeah, you have a command prompt which operates on DOS. So you actually can't use exactly the same um, the same stuff that I use, but CD should still work. So can you open up the command prompt? So you go into start. Actually, I know this one better because I actually have a PC, but. Um, sorry? Yeah, you go you go into, um, you know like where you can search for programs? Just type CMD. You sh that should get you the command prompt program. And then it's basically the same thing, but it runs on a different language. Um, but for the purposes of what we're doing, it's almost the same. Okay, so the Python is the name of the program that you're using to run it with. So it's just, you know, the name of the language. Okay. Um, first.py is the name of the script. So we have two scripts, first.py and open.py. So this time we're accessing first.py. Okay. And then the stuff that's after it is just the stuff that the program is accessing, like with sys.argv. Okay. The reason why I'm, I'm giving this particular example is because um, I'm just showing you that you can um, you can manually input stuff into Python programs, but Text Wrangler? I don't know. Amanda likes this one. Text Wrangler is an HTML editor. You text edit is just a text editor. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it doesn't. It's it's not that yeah, important. Okay. It's fine. <coughs>
Okay, so I've just made a simpler example that it's kind of like, uh, oops, I keep forgetting, can't see that. Okay, I'll use text edit. Okay, so um, all that this does is import this. So this was something that was developed by the original Python programmers to kind of explain the philosophy of Python. All you have to do is type import this and it actually gives you a little poem. So, um, so this script actually only consists of invoking import this. So um, if you do what I just did, so this time there's nothing after the, um, the name of the script. So it's just Python and then the name of the script, which I called import this.py. Um, and all that's inside import this.py is the command import this. It'll give you this, the Zen of Python by Tim Peters. This is actually going to be relevant later. Um, um, I didn't, I just, um, so I made a new file. Um, like in any kind of text editor, text edit, text wrangler, or whatever. And um, in addition to the top thing, which is actually kind of optional sometimes, um, the only command that I wrote was import this. And I saved it as a file. So I'm going to go a little bit out of order and I'm going to show you something. Um, this is actually, I covered this at the end of this document that I made. So you can actually access um, Python interactively. What I've been doing so far is I've been making scripts and then I've been showing you how to run it. So if you don't want to do that, if you just want to like get at the Python and then do it line by line, which sometimes is an easier way to learn it, um, you can, in your command prompt, um, at any kind of directory which you want to be your active directory, um, you just type Python and it actually kind of changes the look of it. So um, see how it says, um, it says Python, the version number, um, and then it says a bunch of other stuff which is, are not important. And then you'll notice that um, the, the cursor is now three arrows instead of what you saw before, which is the name of your computer. So now you're in Python. So now this is like understanding Python for you. So if you do that, it prints it here. Um, so like, the famous print hello world works here too. It just types hello world. So this is now in Python mode. If you used um, some kind of like Unix command, it wouldn't work. So if you were like CD desktop, it would be like, what is that? Okay, if you wanted to open it as, um, you mean open it as in, oh, run it? Then you write Python and then first.py, but it actually takes an additional argument. It just takes some kind of like line, like it'll take anything and then it'll print your file name is. Like in the, in the Python mode, in the three arrows, I saw where's my comment the first.py, and then whatever I want. I am sorry? Oh, from, from what I'm doing right yeah. now? If you want to run first.py, so import sys, like the sys.argv um, requires you to write it as a script because it's taking what you wrote after, like, it's, it's a bit complicated, so you can't really do that. But um, but this is the kind of place where um, here you can do like, I don't know, Python math or something, like, so. Um, control, uh, sorry, in this case, I guess it's command D. No, it's not. Exit. Exit. Oh, great. What did I do? Okay, I don't care about this anymore. Wait, sorry, what did I do? Oh, okay. Yeah, in like every other computer, it's control D. So, I don't know. <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to try. Yeah, you probably can't because it's asking for an additional argument. Um, 
I was just showing you, I mean, it's probably a bad first example, but it was really just like, it's a way of showing you how you can, you can input arguments manually into a Python file as just like a first step. Okay, so um, the next thing I'm going to teach you is how to uh, read text into a Python program. So I have this, uh, this thing called open.txt. You should be able to just open it. Um, it's just like some Beatles lyrics. So um, what I'm going to be doing is, um, is in open.py, Okay, so in open.py, um, I do that sys.argv thing again, and I, um, where I'm asking for a file name, essentially. And then, so you write the file name after open.py, and then it's gonna save it into a variable called fname, and then it's gonna attempt to open a file called fname. So you, you better write a file that actually exists in that folder, otherwise it's gonna give you an error. Um, the R means read mode, the f is just the variable name for the file handler. You don't need to worry about that. Um, then I'm saving um, what I read, so read in the brackets, um, f dot read in brackets, to a variable called contents, and then I'm printing the contents. So okay. So see what I just did? I opened it, I read it, and then I printed it into my terminal. Okay, so now we're gonna go into Python Village and then we're gonna kind of take a step back and then start learning some Python from the beginning. Um, the, the first exercise, incidentally, I'm not gonna like make you do this right now, but um, so the first lesson is actually um, kind of an explanation of why you want to learn Python. And um, I guess the, the basic of that is that it's probably one of the most user-friendly programming languages that currently exists. There's also a ton of um, existing libraries um, everything from um, graphic, like graphing, machine learning, um, things that, I guess, like statistics, um, ones that build upon the statistics and expand it. Um, this t there's even stuff to do with um, matrix operations, so you don't even really need to pay for MATLAB anymore. It's pretty great. So um, the first exercise is actually just to um, do that import this thing that I showed you. And then after you press download data set, you just copy it. So you just press download data set. And then it says, enter import this into your Python command line and see what happens. And that's all that they're giving as an input. And then in here, you're supposed to either copy it or you choose file and you choose whatever you um, got as import this, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, actually, I could, I just, I don't know. Because I already did it as a script, I might as well just, you know. So this actually just saves it into like a file. You don't need to do this, I just, this is just mine. So you can submit it as a file, or you can copy and paste it here. Um, and then um, you should probably put your code so I can see it. Um, although here it won't, it will still let you submit if you don't have the code, but you can do this multiple times if you want. So if you forget to put in your code, you can just do the problem again. Um, and then once you submit, um, it should say, congratulations, you solved the problem. Um, 
and then it'll be a list of your attempts. So as you can see, I've done it three times now. Um, okay, so now onto the actual Python. Okay, so one of the most important features of any programming language is the ability to manipulate variables. That's actually the whole point, to like have a name that represents a chunk of data um, that you're able to call and then manipulate. Um, it's just a name that refers to like either a value, a list, a, we'll show you later, but like a dictionary, any kind of thing can be a variable or stored in a variable. So um, the, the first thing that I'm gonna show you is just basic, um, the kind of like arithmetic stuff that you're probably all very familiar with. Um, so um, you, you should actually try copy and pasting this out into a Python interpreter, might be a good idea. So you go into Python, um, oh, sorry. Okay, go back to Rosalind. Okay, variables and some arithmetic. You can still see it. You won't, uh, you won't be able to solve the problem, but you should still be able to. Okay, wait, so so click it. Is this what you see? Okay, so do you see this part? This is variables and some arithmetic, and where it says click to expand? You click it to expand, okay? Does everyone get that? Is that okay? Okay, um, go to Python Village. Is everyone here? Like everyone knows how to do this? Okay. Um, once you're here, we're doing the second one, variables and some arithmetic. Okay. Click it. You should see this. Okay. Once you're here, you can click to expand the lesson portion. Okay. Is anyone still lost? No? Okay. So, um... It won't let me solve the problem. Yeah, but you don't need to. Um, you have to do that import this thing first. But you don't have to do that right now, that's for homework. So, anyway. Oh, um, you're probably not in the Python village. Okay, is everyone okay? All right, I'm just gonna keep going unless someone else, um, okay. Okay, so what I just did was I set A to the number 324. Um, if you type out A, it says 324. That's what A means now. Um, B equals 24. Um, so, if you set C to A minus B, C should equal 324 minus 24, right? So, um, no, you don't. It's actually just a matter of looking nice. Um, the people who wrote Python recommend that you put in all sorts of like, uh, I guess like a certain type of code grammar. It's just for a way for you to like, um, have code that somebody else can read, but it's actually not necessary for the functionality of the program itself. Um, so, I mean, the neat thing about programming languages is that, um, is that like in addition to the whole like calculator function, you can also get it to print the answer for you. So if you were like print um, C, like, or I guess like print like A minus B is comma, C, and then it kind of tells you in text format. So, um, okay. All right, so a lot of these operations you're, you're undoubtedly familiar with. Um, one thing of note is that in Python 2 point whatever, 
um, division is going to, um, if you do an integer divided by an integer, it'll give you an integer. So a lot of times it'll give you zero when you actually are expecting a decimal. Um, the way that you do that is you just make one of them a decimal first. Um, that's how you fix it, but I'll get into that in a second. Um, one that you may not be familiar with, depending on um, how much you remember from various math classes, is the modulo function. So um, 18 modulo 5 is 3. Um, equals equals just means um, is equivalent to. Um, it's not equals because if you just do equals, you're actually assigning a variable. So, um, so the reason why 18 modulo 5 is 3 is because when you divide 18 by 5, you get um, the, the, the highest, I guess, uh, integer is, I guess the highest integer that you can reach um, that's close to 18 that is also a fa has the factor of 5 is 15. And then um, the remainder is 3. So um, that's what Majulo is. Um, exponentiation, you probably know what that is, except this time, I think a lot of you are probably um, more familiar with the idea of using that, um, that kind of upwards arrow thing to represent exponentiation. But in Python, it's actually two stars. So that's important to know, too. It's not probably not that relevant right now. Um, okay, so so this part that I'm highlighting with my mouse is pretty important. So it's important to note that if you divide two integers, Python rounds down the result. So 18 over divided by 5 equals equals 3. So if you um, made one of them a decimal, as you can see here, it will give you the answer that you're expecting. Um, so what I explained earlier is that an equal sign in almost every programming language, I guess, equal... Um, means assigning a value to a variable. So when you set a equals 3, it means a is now equivalent to the value of 3. Um, however, the equals equals is a Boolean test for whether or not they are the exact same thing, like the exact same value. So, Okay, so um, one interesting thing about Python is that you can actually add strings. So a string is just... Um, a bunch of characters into quotation marks. Um, I think you're probably familiar with this idea of the hello world and quotation marks. Um, if you add them, you actually get, like if I set A equals hello and then B equals um, world, if I added those, so You actually can add them. You can smoosh them together. Um, just as a side note, again, not important right now. If you wanted to kind of make it look, you know, have that space, you have to add a string that is just a space, and then you can get hello world. Okay. So in addition to being able to add them together, you can actually also multiply strings. Interestingly enough, so if you wrote, if you did. Um, so A by, used to equal 324. Remember, we actually now reassigned it to the word hello. So if you do A times 3, you actually get hello, hello, hello. Yeah, just, I don't know, uh, randomly. So um, as you can see from this example, I'm not going to type it out, but if you Rosalind and then B equals Franklin and C is an exclamation mark, then you have A plus the space plus B, which is Franklin, plus C times 3 is Rosalind Franklin with three exclamation marks. So that's pretty cool. Um, OK, I'm going to have to move on to the next one. I didn't bother doing all the uh, examples yet, but I mean, I kind of worked them out. I just haven't submitted them. OK, so the next wor thing we're going to do is, um, str I guess, strings and lists. So you've already kind of seen strings, but um, but I guess we're going to go a little bit more into that right now. So um, so a list is actually um, exactly what it sounds like, um, except that in this particular case in Python, they're always enclosed in square brackets, and each item is always separated by commas. Um, they don't have to be strings, and they don't even have to be the same type. 
actually you can have um, a list with um, you can have a list with uh, with a list as one of the items of the list. Like you can have a list with a mix of strings and numbers. Um, you can have um, you can have an empty list. So there's a lot of uh, like it's not very constrained actually. Okay, so this particular list, I guess they're just trying to keep it simple at first, um, is just a list of strings. So if you print it out. Sorry, I have a silly question. Yeah, no. Um, they don't have to be. Like, uh, if you had like like a equals um, three hundred and twenty-four, you know that is also a string. Yeah, so like now if you tried a um, minus 24, it actually gives you an error because it's not recognizing it as a number. Okay. Yeah, it's text, but, um, but it can accept any ASCII character. Okay. Yeah, so like, um, so a can also equal like an ampersand, you know what I mean? And then like a times a is just a bunch of ampersand, so so that works too. Um, so why did the a minus 24 work? Sorry? Why did the a minus 24 work? The a minus 24 did not work because a is a string of a number. So it's actually treating these of um, three, two, and four as as an, as like ASCII characters, ASCII. not as the value. Yeah. So if you don't. So if you didn't put this, the string quotation marks, yeah, it would just be a number. Um, however, you can't do that with text. If you, if you just wrote like hello without the quotation marks, it's going to give you an error. It's like, I don't recognize this as a number or a variable. Um, OK, so I guess uh, this part where it's saying print tea party 2 is trying to show you um, something that's very important, uh, which is indexing. So um, because a list is actually um, a whole bunch of items, you can access any given item of that list um, by indexing. So in this particular case, it's accessing the, it's not, it's not the second, that's not really the right way of putting it. It's gonna give you Dormouse. And the reason for that is because um, Python is actually a zero-based programming language. So it starts everything, all of its counting with zero. So that's really important to know. If you haven't written that down, you probably should somewhere. Um, so March Hare is the zeroth item, Hatter is the first item, Dormouse is actually the second item. So that's why it does that. Um, I know it's kind of weird, but um, but I mean, I found that like um, sometimes when you're when when you've actually written like a bunch of scripts, you kind of start seeing why they did that. Um, I can't really think of an example right now, but I'll come up with one for next class. Okay, so um, the other thing about lists is that you can actually change the items in the list through indexing. So you can reassign um, one of the items. So, um, so in this example, what they did was um, T party one is now equal to um, Cheshire Cat. Okay, so previously, okay, so um, actually no, it just it just writes the answer, so I'm not going to make you do that. But um, before it read March Hare, Hatter, Dormouse, and Alice. Now it's going to read March Hare, Cheshire Cat, Dormouse, Al Alice. So that's important to know. Um, so the thing about lists is that they too can be added to. So um, it's not actually here, I'm just gonna show you. But if you wrote T party, which by the way is now the change form, plus, and then you put you wrote another list, so square brackets, and then inside's a string, and then you wrote like, um, you know, that caterpillar or something, or you, I don't know. It would do that. So you can you can add an item to the end of the list. But the thing is, um, there there's actually sometimes in Python there's more than one way to do things. So if you want to add something to the end of a list, 
um, you can actually use um, a method called append, which is the way that they actually teach you here. So, hold on, right here. So it says t party dot append Jabberwocky print t party. Um, if you were to do that, so now I've already changed t party by the way, so it's actually not going to print exactly what you see there, but. Um, Oh, actually, no, you are, because I didn't save it. That's right. OK, yeah, I guess that's actually something that I forgot about. So um, if you do, th the reason why people use append instead of plus is because if you do Tea Party plus Caterpillar just like that, it's actually um, a temporary replacement. It's actually a temporary change. Um, but somehow, if you do append, it's a permanent change. So if I were to um, Tea Party here, the Jabberwocky is still there. Um, so I, I guess the lesson is you should probably just use a pen, but you can use plus. Um, OK, so um, the next part that we're going to be covering is something called slicing. So it's similar to indexing, except this time you can get um, a, spe a specific subset of the list. So. Um, so here they're teaching how to do it. It's the name of the list, and then it goes from A to B. Um, so A is the beginning item, which remember is zero based, and then B is actually um, is is not is the one after the last item. So um, if you do list name A to B, you get index A up to but not including index B. Okay, so if I did tea party and then I did um, one, two, three, you get um, zero, one, which is Cheshire Cat, so that's one, so it's a one. And then you get one, two, three. So the three is actually Alice, but because it's up to and not including, you don't get Alice, so you actually only get Cheshire Cat and Dormouse. Um, you don't. You just you just write the next one for yeah. Okay, so um, if you don't include either A or B, so if you just like do um, like tea party like blank and then just like nothing and then colon four instead of just one colon four, it's actually going to assume you meant zero. Um, if you do um, just like some kind of number and then colon, it's going to assume you meant the end. So it'll give you everything to the end. So this is illustrated by their following thing. And I'm actually just going to give you an exercise right now to see if you can solve it um, in a second. But if A equals flimsy and B equals miserable, and then C is um, 0 to 1 of B, which is M I, right? Um, and then plus A two to the N, which is zero, one, two. So I, I, M, S, Y. You should actually get something called Mimsy, right? Okay, so um, I guess my challenge now is if A is flimsy and B is miserable, then how do you get flimserable? So just just try to do that. Just try to get it. I don't actually care. If, like you can shout. One of you can shout out the answer. Um, but I would just want to make sure you know how to do this. By the way, this exact principle applies to lists as well. So it applies to strings. Like we've been exercising on strings. So in this case, um, the string is treated as kind of like I guess an array of characters. Um, printed as a string. Um, however, in a list, it's going to look like the square bracket thing that I've been showing you, um, except it's kind of like a, an array of mixed types. I'm just yes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think I find that it helps conceptually to just count from zero. You know what I mean? So then, like, um, 
I guess when you do it long enough, like the second, like really does become just the third one, but like in your head, it's actually the second. But it kind of avoids confusion. Okay, did everyone get it? You don't actually have to shout it out. It's just, was everyone able to get it? More or less? Okay, I don't see anyone freaking out, so I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so this one's kind of a doozy, I'm just warning you. It's, uh, it's okay if we have to keep going over this one. Um, okay, so, um, I think I think all of you are probably uh, have heard of this somewhere the if else statement. So um, it just kind of like means if some kind of condition, and then you do something, or else if that condition is not matched, you do something else, right? I mean I'm sure most of you have seen or like have heard of this idea. So um, in in Python, I, actually as in most programming languages, you know the syntax is very important. So how you write out the code is. Um, pretty vital to whether or not the code will actually function at all. So um, in Python, um, after an if or the else portion, you have to put a colon. So see this? That's very important. Um, and then whenever you're writing the portion that you want to execute, if that condition is met, you have to have an indent. So um, I guess like the people who wrote Python recommend you actually put four spaces. I personally am lazy and I just do a tab. It doesn't actually matter. You just have to keep it consistent. So um, actually, I'll just give you an idea. Okay, so let's say I'm just writing this out. Okay, you can follow along if you want. It might help, help you actually. So if I wrote A equals 42, again, th this time the spaces are not necessary, but I wrote if A is less than 10, and then I have to write a colon, that's really important, and then I hit enter again, but this time I write a tab, um, or you can do four spaces, that actually probably looks better. Then you can do print. Um, then you have to do the quotation marks, which indicates you're about to write a string. And then inside you write this number is less than 10. And then press enter again, you write else. So else has to align with if. Um, but then when you're telling it what else you would like it to do, if that first one doesn't work out, you have to tap it again, and then you write print um, the number is greater than or equal to 10. Okay, so for this next one, um, in order for this next one to actually work, I think they forgot to do this. You actually have to set B as something. So, um, okay, so I think I, I'm gonna try writing this one out. So if A equals, let's say, um, If A equals, um, I don't know, like 2, and then B equals 2, um, and you wrote if A plus B, and this is, I'm writing it in the interpreter right now so you can see it work in real time. If A plus B equals equals 4, and then colon, um, then it's going to do dot 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 because it's, it's expecting you to write something else. So you tab, and then you can write print. Um, a plus b is 4. So 
I press enter, you should see what I just wrote, right? A plus B is four. However, um, if B equaled three, so I reset B as something else, and then I go to A plus B equals four, and then that thing again, it doesn't print anything because I didn't set an else statement. See what I mean? Oh, yeah, um, I press the up cursor, yeah. So if you press up, it, scale, it goes through whatever you wrote before. Um, this next part is like this, this thing that they did right here is like, it's, it's not that important. I've actually never used it. Um, but like um, in Python in any kind of loop, so every kind of loop that we're just about to cover in the next like 15 or so minutes, um, whenever it exits, if it has like um, something at the end or if it has like a final else statement at the end, it will just always do that if it exits without a break. So I'm not gonna talk about that too much, but that's what they're trying to show right there. Um, okay, so I think this next one um, might possibly be hard to understand, so I'm gonna spend a lot of time with it, interrupt me if you have any problems. So um, here they set the variable named greetings to one. So this is teaching you how to do a while loop. So a while loop is um, a loop that just keeps on going until a condition is met. Um, so it'll just keep like, it'll basically be like um, while and then some, uh, some kind of condition, it'll check the condition. If the condition is true, it'll just go through executing whatever code came afterwards. Um, if it's false, then it exits. Or no, or yeah, if it's false and exits, it breaks out of the while loop. Um, so as you can see, you can, this is like a common source of um, bugs because if you keep it, if you never let it exit, it'll just keep running it and running it and then it'll eventually crash your computer. So that's a problem. Um, but we're gonna cover that in a sec. So greetings equals one, that's its initial setting. And it says while greetings is less than or equal to three colon, and then next line indent, the program will print hello times the number of greetings, which if you remember from before, it will just like, if, if you know greetings is two, it'll be like hello, hello. Um, and then afterwards it says greetings equals greetings plus one, which means greetings is equal to the old value of greetings plus another one. It's now reset the value of greetings to an increment, um, an incrementally higher number. So, um, so like if you just kind of conceptually go through this loop, greetings equals one, while greetings less than equals three. Well, greetings equals one, so yes, it is less than or equal to three. It will print hello, times greetings, which is just one, so it'll just print hello once. Um, and then now, greetings equals greetings plus one, which means greetings equals two, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so now, because it's a while loop, it's gonna go through it again. So, while greetings is less than or equal to three, well, greetings equals two, so yes, it is less than or equal to three. Um, it'll print hello, hello, because greetings is two now, so it's printing it twice. And then it's setting greetings equals greetings plus one. So greetings now equals two, it's equal to two plus one, so now it equals three. So it does that again, except this time it says hello, hello, hello. It says it three times, but then on the fourth time, so, so the, the third time it does this, greetings equals greetings plus one. So now th like greetings, which is three, equals three plus one. So now greetings equals four. So then it's gonna go through the while loop again, it's gonna check it, and now four is not less than or equal to three. So then it's not going to print hello four times, it's just gonna exit. Okay? Did that make sense? Okay, if it didn't make sense, please interrupt me now. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's like, so it's a, this is just like the, the portion that it's, I'm just showing you the portion that you're asking for. So if I wrote hello, exclamation mark, space, 
um, and then I wrote times like let's say three or something, it's gonna do this. Okay. I see. Okay. Um, so this is an example of an infinite loop. So can someone tell me why this is an infinite loop? Like this example right here? Yes, that is a problem. So it will always be less than or equal to 3, in other words. Okay, so um, one thing that's, uh, so I guess, somewhat similar to a while loop, but is much less dangerous, um, is a for loop. So a for loop um, is something is a loop where you preset the number of times you want it to loop, and it just increments through um, like the range that you've given it. So um, or it can actually increment through just anything that's iterable, really. So a list is iterable, um, a string is iterable, because each character of a string can be something fed into a for loop. So I'll show you in a second, but. Um, a list is iterable because you have Alice, Bob, Charlie. So, um, so when you write for name in names, so for and then you're assigning it a temporary variable called names. It could actually be anything for n in names, and then you print hello plus name. So, um, so um, just someone shout out. What what would you expect this to to output? Okay, Amanda, what would, <laughs> what would you expect it to help? <laughs> no, names equals Alice, Bob, Charlie, for name and names, print hello, name. That is exactly correct. If you have not heard that answer, it's um, what it's going to output is hello, Alice, hello, Bob, and hello, Charlie, because it went through each one, and then it printed hello plus whatever the item was, right? The name could be anything. Yeah, it could have been anything. Yeah, um, it would totally do that. Um, it doesn't even have to be hello. I mean, yeah. um, so um, so just interestingly, if if this was Alice, so if you wrote for name in or for letter in Alice, and you wrote print letter, you would actually get A L I C S. So I'll show you. I'm just showing you that a string can be iterable as well. So for letter in Letter is just something I picked, right? It could have been anything. Alice, which is a string, colon, return, space, or just tab. Um, print, letter. There you go. See? So that's iterable as well. Um, you can also iterate through um, a range of numbers. So here, n equals 10 for i in range n. So range is a function that just produces a list of numbers. So range um, 10, just so you can see, actually produces this. So it produces, um, starting at zero, it produces 10 items um, up to, but not including 10, just like the indexing. Um, so, sorry? Um, because you need to give um, a variable name to take um, to take the sub item that you're iterating, to take the sub item from the list. Do you know what I mean? You have you have a list and it's called names, right? But then you need you in order to do manipulations on the sub item, in this case Alice that you're pulling through, um, you need to assign that to a variable. So you're assigning it to a variable called name. So the function for tells you the very next word you type before. Yes, it does. Yeah. Exactly. So for recognize the for loop um, knows that this next thing you type, it could be anything, could be blah, whatever. And then you write in, um, and then you write the name of the thing that you're iterating through, or it can just be the item itself, like I showed you with Alice. Um, and then you print, and then you can just do something to it. So like, for example, if I did like for, um, for num, in, so here they use i, I use num. You can, that's why I'm, I'm trying to show you they can really use anything. For num in range um, 10, you can do like 
iterative arithmetic things. So you can write um, print uh, num times two. So see, you can, like that's why you assign it a variable name because you want to do things to it too. Okay, so um, this is just like a, like a point of interest about the function range. You can actually um, set a beginning limit to the, to the range. So if you were like range um, 5, 12, it would actually give you, um, it would basically give you 5 to 11. Yeah. Okay, so just to recap, um, we covered three major things. So the first one is the if-else statement. Um, that is a, a way for you to, um, to set some kind of a condition to an execution of a block of code. Um, the next thing that we covered was the while statement, and that's actually um, a way of conditionally looping through a block of code over and over until the co condition is no longer met. Um, the last thing that we covered was the for loop, which is um, a way of presetting a list of things or just like some kind of iterable thing that you want to go through one item at a time. Um, and then in all, in, in all the cases, um, you can execute a certain block of code based on um, some kind of preset condition. Okay, so I'm actually gonna do dictionaries next and then we'll go to working with files last because I kind of already covered working with files a tiny bit. Okay, so Python actually has this um, really interesting data type that is like super useful. Um, it's called the dictionary. So unlike a list, um, it's not actually ordered. Um, it's actually um, a series of key value pairs where um, a key is a way is um, is something that you use to find something and then that the value that the key is linked to is what you will retrieve every time you use that key. Okay, so um, I guess one of my favorite examples for a dictionary is, um, for example, like um, codon to amino acid um, conversions. So um, like all the codons are the keys and then the values are the corresponding amino acid. Um, as you can probably tell, just like with codons and amino acids, your codons have to be, your keys have to be unique. You can't have two keys in a dictionary that are exactly the same because if that is the case, you don't, like Python can't reasonably tell which value to retrieve, right? I mean, it's not possible. So um, here they use phone numbers. So Zoe's phone number is that, and then Alice's is this other thing. And it's the dictionary itself is saved to a variable called phones. So then um, the way that, um, that they retrieve the phone number is actually very similar to the indexing for the list that I showed you earlier. Um, except this time, instead of using a number, you actually use the name of the key which in this case is Zoe. Um, so actually um, indexing for a dictionary is much more intuitive than indexing a list. Um, okay, so um, in this manner, you should actually be able to access every value by indexing using their corresponding key. Um, however, the dictionary itself, as I said, is not ordered, so it will keep shuffling the order um, whenever you print it, because it doesn't really care about the order. Um, the thing is, a dictionary, you can actually, um, you can assign value, you can assign key value pairs to a dictionary. Um, so um, this, uh, this like two curly brackets. Oh, by the way, I probably should have mentioned, um, dictionaries, unlike lists, use curly brackets. So that's very important. So. Um, if you're using curly brackets, you're gonna about to create a dictionary. If you use square brackets, you're about to create a list. You can't switch that up. If you switch it up, you're gonna get an error. So um, just like with lists, you can assign an empty dictionary um, that you're about to populate. 
So um, this is cool because you can kind of like create dynamic dictionaries where you just keep adding key value pairs and then using them to reference things. Um, so if you wrote d equals this, d right now doesn't equal anything. Um, if you wrote d, so the way that you um, assign el el key value pairs into a dictionary is you write d in the, the square bracket, the indexing thing, and then inside you write a key of choice. So you can write like seven equals, oh whoops, equals seven. So now D actually has um, a key value pair with a string seven references its number. Um, so um, that's another important thing to ex uh, another important thing to emphasize is that um, just like lists, it can tolerate mixed types. So um, your key can actually be a, a number. It can be um, a string. Um, it can actually um, be a list, but you can't use the one. You can't use square brackets. You have to use round brackets. We didn't really cover that, but um, a list that you cannot change the elements of is called the tuple, um, and you can use tuples as keys, but not lists because you can change. Since you can change the items in a list, they don't let you use it as a key. Um, but that's not really important. You um, you very rarely have to use um, a list as a key. So usually you want the value to be a key. You want some kind of way of referencing some kind of gigantic list, right? So in that case, you can give it a name. So like if you had like um, a list of genes in a pathway, um, your key would be the pathway name. It can just be a string. And then your list is a list of strings of the gene names that belong to that pathway. So that's one example of an application of a dictionary. Um, <clears throat> OK, so um, here's another example of that conditional statement, except this time also applying dictionaries. Um, if Peter in phones, so before we had phones, here we have, um, it says Bill is this thing. We have Bill, Zoe, and Alice. And um, when you write if Peter in phones, this is a way of asking if Peter's number is logged in the phone dictionary, the phone number dictionary. Um, as you can probably tell, it's not. So um, the else statement is important. You write print, we don't know Peter's phone. And then inevitably, it's going to write, we don't know Peter's phone, because you didn't actually have it. Um, however, um, you can give this a shot. If you, OK, so and see, I'm going to, OK, phones equals what I just wrote. OK, so now I have phones, that's our dictionary. So phones, that's Bill's phone number. Um, of course, we don't have Peter's, but we can assign Peter's using the way that I showed you before. So you just kind of, um, you just kind of index as if it was already there, but this time you're giving an assignation. So you can go like one, two, three, dash, four, five, dash, six, seven. And then now, um, now it's there. And also, you can check um, you can check the 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 conditional statement Peter in phones. It'll be true. It is now in phones. Uh, no, it can. Do, um, dictionaries take mixed types, so it doesn't. Um, it doesn't have to be numeric. And anyway, this is a numeric. This is actually um, a string. So it wouldn't read them as numbers anyway. I put a word with a word instead of the second word plus Oh, you possibly didn't enclose it in quotation oh, yeah, marks? Right. Yeah, that's possibly what you did. Okay. Um, so if you ever write a string, people, it has to be in quotation marks. Um, if it's not, it's, they're going to think it's a variable. And if you didn't already assign a variable of that name, it's going to give you an error. Um, okay. So uh, this couple of other things that we show you, like you can apparently you can delete entries in a dictionary. So I've actually never done that personally, but apparently you can. So you just like you, you write Dell and then you know phones Zoe, and then if you do it again, see here it's Zoe and Alice. You, you Dell Zoe. Zoe's no longer in the phone list.
Okay, so the last lesson is reading and writing. Um, okay, so so yeah, I, I mean, I guess there's a reason why they made this the last lesson because it is probably um, the most, uh, it's probably not a good idea to introduce the idea of opening a file um, before you do all that other stuff. But um, so one way that you can open a file is you set f equals open and then the name of the file and then r, which means read mode. Um, w is write mode, which we're going to do later. Um, a like A is append mode, which is similar to write mode, except instead of writing over the file, you write after the file. You know what I mean? You write a bunch of other stuff. Um, okay, so this is obviously assuming you have an actual file called input.txt in your, in your file, otherwise it doesn't really work. Um, it'll give you an error. Um, the way that I did it was in a with loop like so if you looked at my original file in open.py um, I do it slightly differently but you can also do it this way so if you like this way better as opposed to the one that I gave you in my example you can totally do it this way it doesn't really matter um, so um, I guess like it's kind of confusing because um, what this is doing is essentially um, populating something called the file handler um, I don't really know how to describe that too well, except with its, what's already the information contained in its name. But um, suffice it to say, you can use this file handler to then access the contents of the file. So um, f dot read. Um, so forget the n. The the highlight is says f dot read n. Just don't worry about that. You just use f dot read. Um, hold on. Okay, so the way that I did it was in an um, in a with loop, which is actually um, it's just what you said, except instead of f equals open file name r, it's with open file name as f. It's anyway. You just have to copy and paste whichever example you like better. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then here I said the contents of the file f dot read so I read the contents I put it into a variable called contents and then I printed the con the contents so um, so um, you can do that you can also there's another one called read line so all it does is it takes one line from the file um, and then you can keep doing that until you get every line of the file um, so if I, okay, so let's say f equals open, um, open.txt. Okay, so f.read will give you this, okay. So um, all these that all these backslash ends are new lines, which means that it's telling the computer to display the whatever comes afterwards as another line, and just keeps doing this until it runs out of backslash ends. Um, if I did um, okay, so wait. If I did f dot read again, I will get nothing because a file handler is basically extinguished once you call it. Um, yeah. So you have to kind of open it again. But um, if I did f.read, this time I'm going to do f.read line. It'll only give me the first one up until the end. OK, so I'm going to do this again. Um, and then this time I'm going to do um, this one I actually use a lot. It's f.read.split line. Um, and what it does is it takes every line and it makes it into an item in a list. So um, you can probably see how that's pretty useful. Makes it nice and iterable. Why do you do the parentheses at the Because it's it's a way of sh of saying that you're invoking a method, um, as opposed to like a variable. Because variables don't have the parentheses at the end, right? So it's telling the it's telling Python that you want to um, you want to get a function or a or a method.
Okay, so I already covered split lines. Um, okay, so there's a way, um, obviously if you can you know, read a file, you can write a file. Um, so if I just, uh, okay, let's, I'm gonna open the file handler again, and then this time I'm gonna write read f.readline, except I'm gonna save the contents of f.readline, which as you remember is just sheet dog backslash n. I'm gonna write um, sheet dog equals f.readline. So now, so that's actually how you get, um, this is actually how you should always uh, do it. You have to assign whatever um, you're getting out of the file handler into a separate variable, otherwise it's gonna get ex extinguished the minute you, um, you call it. So, um, so now it's just, it's this, right? Except it's kept here forever, whereas f is, um, Oh yeah, by the way, if I do f.readline again, it gets the next line. Just, yeah, it's a quirk. So um, if I wanted to do f.write, oh wait, no, no, I can't do that. I guess it's like, um, in order to write, you have to open a file handler again. So you actually don't have to call it f, you can also call it file, you can call it anything you want, um, equals open. But then this time, because you're writing, um, two things change. One, you actually have to um, give it the name of either a file that already exists, which means you're going to write over it or write after it in the case of using a pen. But um, you have to give it a new name, so like new.txt, um, and then w instead of r because you're doing write. Okay, so um, this time you have a file handler open in write mode, so you go file or f in here they show. Here they do F. I write file, just to show you that you can pick any letter you want. And then inside the write method, you have to um, write what it is you want to write. So I'm just going to write sheet dog, whatever is in that variable. Okay. So um, if that worked properly, then I should actually get. Um, I should actually have a new file called new.txt which is exactly what happened, um, except this one. Oh, right. Hold on. That's weird. Oh yeah, there you go. I forgot to close the file. So with a, in a with loop, you don't have to close the file. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, I can go over that with you personally if you want to, but it's not that important. So um, what I just did was I wrote the line that I wanted to write in a new file. Okay, so that's actually all that there really is to it. Um, I, I guess, okay, so I guess there's this one last thing, the split. So um, you can actually convert a list into, sorry, a string into a list by saying what you want to split it by. Um, so like if you had like a string that was like, um, I don't know, like, hello world, and then there was like a space in the middle of it, um, except I'm gonna call it string equals, okay, so you can actually do string dot split, and then you can say what you want to split it by, um, and then you can actually set a space so that it'll give you hello world as two separate things because it's looking for spaces it's gonna split the string by the space. Um, that's just something that I found in the middle that I forgot to talk about. But um, other than that, that's actually pretty much all that there is to the beginning component of Python. So um, what I just described comes with a series of um, exercises. There's about five of them in total. You can work on them together um, or by yourself um, in groups of any size, it doesn't really matter. Um, however, I will be here on Saturday at three in order to either go through all of this again, um, possibly without this whole AV thing, um, and or um, help you with the problems, um, answer any questions, it doesn't really matter. Um, but that's about it. So remember to email me your usernames, um, and that's it. Um, 
next week? Yeah. Just, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, next Tuesday. Um, the ones in the Python yeah. Village, so the ones after every lesson that I covered.